Hello, everyone, and welcome to Well of Life Bible Training Ministry. I'm so glad to be able to share with you another lesson on the basics of Bible doctrine. My name is uh, Reverend James Sessoms, and I'm going to be sharing this lesson with you. It's Course 2, Lesson Number 19, Part 1, God's Role in Salvation. But before we get into it, let's have a word of prayer and ask God's blessings upon this teaching. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it will touch the lives of those to whom you send this video to all across the world. And Father, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to share your message. May it be a blessing May it be richly received. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So, the objective for this lesson is this. In this study, we'll see that salvation is entirely God's work and that each member of the Trinity plays a part. I want you to remember that. <clears throat> Excuse me. The key verse that we'll be using for this lesson is found in Ephesians 1 and 11. It says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. The Bible teaches that God always takes the first step towards us. We do not find God by ourselves. And that's very important. Nicodemus came to Jesus in the dead of dark because he didn't want the other Jewish scholars of his day to know that he was going to Jesus to find out some truths about this person. And oftentimes, we ourselves have to realize that the Holy Spirit is the one who nudges us, who pricks our hearts, and gives us the ability to take the moment, take the time, to look up towards our Savior and our Lord and ask him to come into our hearts, to forgive us of our sins. And so it's very important that when we see this statement being made, that God takes the first step, then we need to respond quickly to it. We don't need to hesitate, but we need to respond to that nudging or that pricking of our hearts by the Holy Spirit. This was true in the Garden of Eden, it was true at the cross, and it is certainly true today. Let's look at some scripture. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Ab Adam said, <clears throat> or Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So we see that God made the first step towards Adam and Eve, and especially Adam, whom he gave control over the Garden of Eden. And because of their sin, they hid themselves. And so it is very important when like I said a minute ago, that when God, by the Holy Spirit, nudges our hearts or pricks our hearts, we need to respond. We don't need to hide ourselves like Adam and Eve did, but we need to acknowledge the fact that we need Christ. All false religion teaches, listen to this now, all false religion teaches that man can reach God by his own effort. But the Bible reveals that God begins and finishes the work of salvation. So in this study, 
we'll look at how God plans and accomplishes our salvation. Each member of the Trinity participates in the work of salvation. The Father plans for our salvation. That's the key step. The Son offers himself as a perfect sacrifice. And then secondly, the Spirit draws us to salvation. That's what I was saying earlier. The Spirit pricks our heart and confirms in us the need for a Redeemer. What does the Father do? God is holy and just, so sin must be punished, but he is also a God of mercy, grace, and love. And I want you to focus on those three words as we take a few moments to go over the word mercy, grace, and love. The first one is mercy. Mercy is when God withholds his just punishment from us. In other words, God sees our hearts and knows our hearts, and mercy is revealed when God withholds what is right, what we should receive, but he withholds it. Grace is when God blesses us even though we don't deserve it. Hallelujah. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. He blesses you and I even though we don't deserve it. And then lastly, love is when God desires the highest and best thing for us. In those three uh, key factors, they're wonderful to know. We would be destroyed apart from the mercy, grace, and love of God. In Lamentations, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. In Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, that we are, that because his, uh, let's read this again. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because he, uh, he has compassion and his compassion fails not. Verse 23 says, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Isn't that good to know that God's mercies are renewed on a daily basis? What does the Father do to bring about our salvation? He planned our salvation, sent his Son and called us. Let's look at some key factors in these thoughts. First, the Bible teaches that God planned our salvation before the world was made. In Ephesians 3, verses 9 through 11, it says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Verse 10, to the intent that now, that's very important, to the intent that now, a bold statement Paul is getting ready to reveal, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Verse 11, according, another key word, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, do you understand what we just read? Those are such powerful statements that Paul is making us to understand by the Holy Spirit. To make all see everyone to see what the fellowship of the mystery is from the beginning of the age, from the beginning of creation. God had a purpose in mind to bring salvation to the world. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, 
but according to his own purpose and grace. That is so good to know, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. There we go again. God had a plan when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, e e Garden of Eden, God had a plan in place to bring redemption to the world. Second, the Bible also teaches that God has called us to salvation. God knows who will believe, and so he calls us out from the world. Be not of the world. Don't be one foot in and one foot out. When salvation comes, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, come out from among the world. We have to live in it, but we don't have to participate in the things that bring us to a point of idol worship and emptiness and darkness and loneliness and despair. They'll try everything they can to make you feel comfortable in the world that we live in. But Jesus said to the Father, he said, I pray that you not take them out of the world, but teach them to live above the world. Teach them to live a holy and a godly life. And that's what we want. That's what you need and I need every day in our lives. Acts 13 verses 47 through 49 reads as follows. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Verse 48 and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. We can have eternal life by believing. In verse 49, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Isn't that the good news? When you receive good news, you want to share it. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Very, very powerful scriptures. Verse 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, I don't have time to get into predestination. It's a very large subject, and many people uh, have their minds made up about predestination. Well, if, for example, people say, if you've been predestined to uh, go to hell, then why would you want to serve a, a God who died on the cross and said that he would forgive us of our sins if you've been predestined. Or you could say the opposite, if you've been predestined, then what does it matter what we do in this world? And so that's a subject for another time, but you can see how in the, the word of God that says here that whom he did predestinate, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. Well, why would you want to serve any other God, or worry about any other thing when these three facts have been given to you and you can receive them by faith in Christ Jesus by receiving salvation into your hearts. 1 Thessalonians 1 4 says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And that's another subject that we don't have time to get into. But <clears throat> the lesson <clears throat> show, shares with us these scriptures so that you personally can study them and get more insight into them. Second, <clears throat> Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. God has chosen you. God knows your heart. He knows 
that you have a soft, pliable heart. And because of that, he chooses you because he has a plan for your life. And the sooner you can understand that plan for your life, the more uh, resilience you become, the more joyful you become, and the more purposeful you become. And you want to wake up every morning saying, Lord, what would you have me to do today? Verse 14 says, wherein too he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I just talked about that. We don't fully understand how God chooses us and calls us to salvation. It's difficult. I talked about predestination and I talked about the word election. We know that God is not willing that any should die in their sins. We know that from John 3.16. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. I, I, I love that scripture in Hebrews where it says, Because he could swear by no greater, he swore to himself. There's nothing that God has not promised in his word that he will not fulfill in you and your life and my life. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now you need to write that down and study those scriptures out, all these scriptures that I've been talking about, because it's all a part of what we're trying to get across to you about our salvation through Jesus Christ. But we also know that God calls every believer out from the world. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. This was true of Abram and the children of Israel, and it's true of us. Let's look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, when God called Abram out from his kindred. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. I remember personally when God called me into the ministry, and the first ministry experience that I had was in Monroe, North Carolina, a very small uh, church there. But the calling of God was even a greater experience for me because I not only was called into the ministry, but God's greater purpose was that I begin a ministry called Operation Reach Out, which is going now on its 34th year. And had I not been obedient to the call of God, not only when I have not went to the uh, city called Monroe, North Carolina, but I would have not been able to fulfill the ultimate purpose of God for my life in beginning a ministry there that is touching hundreds and thousands of life, lives a year through the gifting that God, uh, an anointing that God placed in my life to touch people's hearts. So you've got to recognize the call of God in your life. Romans 9, 11 through 15 says this, for the children being not yet born, now that's a very deep subject. Neither having done any good or evil that the purpose of God, according to the election, might stand, not of the works, but of him that calleth. Verse 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. In verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Verse 14, what shall we then say? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Verse 15, for he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, we see so much intertwined in those scriptures. And as we go forward, we're going to get more and more into how God planned salvation for us and how it's worked out in our lives by receiving Jesus as Lord and then 
uh, recognizing the calling of God and the purpose of God that he has for you and I. In Acts 13, 48, it says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. It is all about recognizing the good news that Jesus brings. He doesn't bring bad news like the world brings. But he brings good news to you and I so that we can be joyfully happy in being a part of the kingdom of God through eternal life. And then finally, the father sent his only son to bring his plan to completion. There had to be a plan and there had to be someone to carry out that plan. Whenever God has a purpose for your heart, then he puts that plan in your heart. Not all the way through. I walked by faith for years and years, knowing that God had a plan for the ministry, but he gives you uh, your, your plan step by step. Doesn't dump it all in, in your memory like a computer and then you carry it out. No, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. So we have to, we have to know that God orders our steps as he sees us being committed and obedient to the calling of God in our lives. And then finally, the father sent his only son to bring his plan to completion. Here's my, here's probably everyone's favorite scripture, if not one of the most favorite scriptures is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In 1 John 4, 10, it says, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. Isn't that wonderful? So we're going to get into four uh, important key factors here in the next few minutes. And I want you to pay close attention to them as we go over them, because... As we take each one of these uh, key steps and dissect it, you'll begin to see more and more what we just spent uh, 15, 20 minutes on. So number one is this. What does the son do? What does Christ do? The son willingly offered himself to the father's will. That's, the, that's very important for you and I to understand that. If Christ submitted himself to the father's will, then of course we must do the same. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. It's very important that we, that we not run ahead of God's will for our lives, but to, to submit to it and allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. Hebrews 9, 14 says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, a purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In Mark 14, verse 36, it says, And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. It was Jesus' submission to the cross that won the victory knowing what was going to be accomplished through his obedience. And then number two point is this, the son willingly laid down his life as a sacrifice for us. He willingly laid it down. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for a ransom for many. In other words, he willingly went to the cross so that he could redeem all those who would accept what he did and accept eternal life through Jesus Christ and through the a blood of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins. He did all of this for you and I. People say, well, I'm not worthy to receive 
eternal life or you don't know what I've done in the past. It's not based on what you did or didn't do. It's all based on the plan of salvation that was completed in the person of Jesus Christ and his willingness and his submission to die on the cross for a ransom for all. Ephesians 5, 2 says, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It was a sweet smelling savor. Have you ever cooked your favorite meal and you lifted the lid to that favorite meal and you could smell the aroma as it hit your taste buds? Well, that's what that sacrifice that Christ completed on the cross was to God, his Father. It was a sweet aroma. It was a completed sacrifice. And it was completed as he died on the cross and then uh, said, it is finished. Everything that needed to be accomplished was, a, was finished when he lifted up his voice for the last time on that cross and said to the Father, it is completed. It's finished. The work of salvation is now available to all who will receive it. Galatians 1.4 says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the, this present evil, according to the will of God and our Father. In other words, he would deliver you and I from the presence of this evil world according to the will of God. What is according to the will of God? That was God's plan that we've been talking about all this time. 1 Timothy 2, 6 says, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. In other words, after he died, after he was buried, and after he rose again on the third day and went to his disciples and gave them uh, his last will and testament and gave them their orders, their marching orders, the call of God for their lives, then uh, he sent them out to be a what? To be a witness of the things that they had heard and seen and testify of those things. And that's what I'm doing today on this video. I am sharing what I have experienced by faith in Christ Jesus. And I am testifying and being a witness that there is a God in heaven, that Jesus Christ did come to the earth. He did die on a cross. He did, uh, he was buried on the third day or after his death. And on the third day, he did arise from the dead. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. A sacrifice is when you give something up. Christ gave up all of the glory that he had in heaven to die for you and I. Isn't that amazing? How could you not receive this gift that didn't cost you anything? Would you turn a gift down like that? But yet many people do. And then point number three, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit applies now listen to that key word. Listen to that. The Holy Spirit applies the work of Christ to our hearts. He convinces, convicts us of sin, brings understanding to the word of God, and brings new life to the heart and makes our salvation secure. It doesn't get any better than that. How does, he, how does the Holy Spirit do that? First, the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts of sin and judgment. You can't receive true salvation if, if, you don't, if you aren't convicted of what you're doing and knowing that what you're doing is wrong. Many people go about doing things and they have no conviction of it. And they, they wonder why they end up in perilous times and perilous uh, troubles and bad choices and bad decisions. It's simply because your heart has been cold and callous towards the Holy Spirit that 
that has taken up residence in you when you receive salvation and you don't recognize the conviction of your heart of sin and judgment. John 16, 8 says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Well, didn't Jesus come into the world? Absolutely. Secondly, the Holy Spirit brings understanding to the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word, but spiritual understanding comes from the Holy Spirit. In other words, you can't totally understand the things of God and the word of God if you don't know that the Holy Spirit is living and abiding in you. Jesus said, I will not leave you as an orphan, but I will send the comforter, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, and he will reside in you and he will show you of things to come, even those things that I have spoken of and now tell you while I am yet with you. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. First Corinthians 2, 11 says, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of God? man which is in him. In other words, the spirit of man, the Holy Spirit. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. The spirit of God is there inside of you as your advocate, your go-between. And then thirdly, the Holy Spirit brings new life to the heart. I'm so glad that I've received a no longer a heart of stone, but now I received a heart of the flesh, the spirit of God living and breathing on the inside of me, convicting me of my sins, letting me know that when I'm doing something wrong, I can trust God to convict me of that so that I don't go down a path or don't go down a road of no return. I'm so glad for that. We are spiritually dead because of our sins. The Holy Spirit gives us new life in Christ, and now we're gonna read some scriptures about that. Ephesians 2, 1 says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in your trespasses and sins. John 3, 5, 6 says, Jesus answered, verily, verily I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 6, for which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, well, how can a man be born again? Shall he enter into his mother's womb again? No, he missed the whole point. The whole point was Jesus said that you must be born again. In other words, you must allow the outward man, that sinful man, to die to the things of this world and the sins of this world so that a new birth can begin from the inside out so that you can be transformed so that you no longer are that old man, that old nature of sin that goes about doing what it pleases instead of what the word of God wants us and shows us how to live in this world that we live in today. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to the mercy, he saved us. By the mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So when we receive the Holy Spirit into our hearts, into our lives, then as we read the word of God and study the word of God, the Holy Spirit reveals the truth to us and it's like, the, it's like taking a pitcher of water and pouring it over our heads and it cleanses us, it washes us, it purifies our inward man so that we become more holy and more aware that it's through the word of God, it's through regeneration by the word of God that we grow and draw closer to Christ. John eleven twenty five 25 says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now that had to be very public, uh, very uh, difficult for them to understand that. But they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, comes, it will reveal all things to you. It will reveal the truth because the truth will set you free. And then lastly, number four, the Holy Spirit makes our salvation secure. I'm so glad that I have my salvation secure in Christ, but I don't go out and uh, sin just because my salvation is secure. That makes, makes us have to think that we're gonna have to put Christ back on the cross. No, when he forgave you of our sins, why would you want to sin again? Why would you want to keep sinning if he's done, what he's done for you is not good enough? Then nobody's got any hope. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, and that what I just said, the gospel of your salvation, that's the gospel, that's the good news, in whom also after that you believed, you have to believe in order to, to receive, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. See how that works? When we receive Christ Jesus into our hearts and we hear the word of truth, which is the good news of salvation, after we have believed, then the Holy Spirit seals us of that promise that we are now children of the kingdom. We're no longer children of the world. You can't live in the world and live in the kingdom. They, they're going to collide. What fellowship, Paul said, does darkness have with light? You just can't do it. It won't work. Ephesians 4.30 says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. There you go. Whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Grieve it not. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by partaking of all these worldly things that you think are going to bring you joy and happiness, when in reality, those are called pleasures. They're not real in the heavenly places, in the kingdom of God. Those are just simple fleshly pleasures. And there's nothing wrong with having fleshly pleasures, as long as it doesn't keep you from doing the will of God. It doesn't keep you from your prayer time and your Bible study time and fellowship with other believers. Those things are a, a joyous time when you can be with family or friends or you can take a vacation or you can do something joyful, but you don't mingle it uh, with the things that God has already told you not to mingle with. Don't don't go out there and tempt God. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. He's given it freely. And it earns, it earns more and more of a realization of what Christ has done for us. And we want to be partakers of that. We want to enjoy that more and more. A seal is a mark of ownership. When the fruit of the Spirit is seen in our life, we know that we belong to God. Isn't that good? I had a seal uh, when I started Operation Reach. I had a nonprofit seal. And when I would stamp that seal on a document, that document, that seal represented that the things that were on or in that document were true to the best of my ability. And when we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, then we are part of, we are, we are owned by the one who redeemed us. And we can get into more than that later. Second Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his. Isn't that wonderful? God knows those are truly his. God knows a person who's, whose life 
has been committed to the plan that God has for him or her. God already knows, even before we do it, God knows whether or not we're going to be committed to him. He already knows if we're going to uh, truly accept what he did for us on the cross. God realizes a person's heart. He, he even wrote about that, about his servant David. He said, David is like a man after my own heart. Dave, was David perfect? No, we're not perfect. But if our heart is pure towards God and we're quick to repent and ask for forgiveness of our sins, then God sees that. And he loves a gentle heart. He loves a heart that is not full of stones and hardness, but is pliable and soft and that he can reach out and touch that heart. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from sin. You see what I'm saying? Or even there, God warns us not to be involved in sin. Get away from it. It'll ruin your life and everyone around you. So in conclusion, we're going to wrap this up. John reminds us once again that God always takes the first step towards us. Everything he's done for us is because of his great love. 1 John 4.10 says, herein is love. Oh boy, look at this. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. What should we, or what should our response be? First, we should love him because of his great love for us. 1 John 4.19 says, we loved him because he first loved us. Secondly, we should also love our fellow believers with the love of Christ. 1 John 4.11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Boy, we need that in the world today, don't we? If we have the love of God shining in our hearts, then how much more is it in this world that we live in today that other people need to see that love coming out of us, emanating from us. We should love them because God first loved us. And then thirdly, Paul reminds us that we should love those who have never experienced that God is love. We need to bear witness to them. How many people are you witnessing to of your love for Jesus Christ. If you're ashamed of him, he said, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. You shouldn't be ashamed to tell people about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And even in this world we're living in today, it seems to be more and more difficult for, for believers in Christ to share that because they're afraid. Well, I can tell you something right now. Don't be fearful. Perfect love casts out fear. Do you love God? Then he'll take care of you. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we, we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Then we're all dead. Listen, as we close this, uh, this year out, um, I probably have course tw uh, lesson number 20 to finish out this year, and then we'll begin 2024 with 11 more lessons, I want to leave you with this, that uh, I pray every day for you that as you listen to these messages that God will bless you and give you understanding about all that he's done for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I pray your, his blessings on you. God bless you richly. And until we see each other again, uh, may the richness of this day be a blessing. And may you love the Lord more and more each and every day. God bless.